you call me your baby when you hold Two weeks ago, I got this book at the library, and uh, I've been so busy and uh, didn't really get around to it, so I went and renewed it. I got it two more weeks, and uh, sat on the couch this afternoon and uh, started flipping through it. And a funny thing happened. Okay, um, this is called the DC Comics of Visual History. Okay, and what they do is that it's exactly what it says. Uh, this is a uh, going through uh oh my god i don't know how many years now i think starting in 1936 1938 uh they go through the year all the years of uh in decades of dc comics and they'll give you a year and then they'll show you a comic book that came out that month and they'll have like a little little trivia on it or maybe a little article in here a couple double page spread and, you know it's, it's just a fun little read you know and that's how i get all my comic book trivia i've always read things back to front and interviews this absorbed it like a sponge it was always in the background of my life but as I went through this book um, you know I would read more things on a certain page or about a certain subject and stuff and start I'd flip through it and skip a few things and then a funny thing happened I got to the 70s and people who are the new viewers or new subscribers to the channel um, I've collected comics since I've read comics since 1977. I had an uncle and a stepdad in the in the house, and around the time I was four, they just had all these comics around. And I, read, I started out on you know Silver Age uh, Marvel comics and Superman and stuff in the 70s, and uh, and about I don't know, going on like it's got to be like four years ago. Uh, one of the first videos where I directed it actually towards the whole community, talking about what the community was. Um, you know, towards the end of the video, I started holding up comics from over the decades that are in my collection. And with about 90% of this stuff, when I look at a comic, I can actually tell you what was going on when I bought it, where I was at, what was going on around the house and stuff. Um, and things like that. I mean, it triggers memories. I mean, in, in I mean, big time memories, very, you know, not just recollections and stuff. I mean, I am there sometimes. And as I got, you know, to the 70s and stuff, you know, it's got the Commandy and the Sandman and stuff that I remember reading as a kid. And a lot of the stuff I still have. This is where I started, you know, uh, the more books they showed on a page and stuff, the more that I had those books. And I started going through here and, you know, around 75, you know, I've got the Atlas uh, first issue special. I've got the first issue of Joker from the 70s tour, Justice Incorporated. You know, they're all here. They're all here. Claw number one and stuff. And uh, <laughs> I had the page marked, you know, as we're going through there. And then it happened. We get up to 1978. Um, and I saw this DC Comics Presents number one in here from August. It tells you the month there uh, in the year of 1978. And it, it triggered something. The weekend before I started kindergarten, I remember going, uh, everybody was in the car, and we went down to Raven Drug Store, and uh, the stepdad walked out with a stack of comics and stuff that he had bought, and that was in there, that Superman and Flash, and I remember reading it and flipping through it. No idea where it's at now, you know, it's, I mean, a lot of that stuff did not survive with me, you know, and uh, I just had the vivid memory of, uh, my mom was very young, and uh, it was the first day of kindergarten for me, going to school, and I'd reached that point where, you know, I was so excited because that was going to be the last summer that I was outside playing by myself while the other kids were in school and, you know, stuff like that. And that morning, that first morning of school was a really good memory of my mother because she was very young and we lived in a trailer. And when I woke up, it's like I woke up ready to go. I was completely wide awake. I mean, I just came out of it like that. I was so excited. And I looked up and there's my mom just waiting on me, smiling. And it was like something out of a postcard or a movie or something the sun was shining through the window right on her I mean it was very angelic you know you know and as I started going through this through the 70s by the time we get to the eight I mean in 1979 you know my first I got my first comic here somewhere but uh, I mean this isn't it but right here I've still got this Batman book 
from uh, January of 1979, uh, making a killing. It's first appearance of Lucius Fox, you know, uh, Batman 307. And but I didn't get it that month. I got it later in the summer because it was in a three pack and it's a Whitman variant. I remember getting it for a dollar at this uh, five and dime store that used to be beside of uh, the high school and stuff. And I've ended up just walking through my entire life from the first day of kindergarten all the way up until um, 2005, the month that I got, you know, we separated and got a divorce in my life. And then it just blew me away because from 2005 to the this thing ends around 2014, the last 10 years have just flown by, have flown by. It was just amazing. I mean, um, you know, the 80s, DC really popped. I mean, it was really a, good, a really good time uh, as you go through this. You know, you see, uh, you just see the rise of the Teen Titans, the rise of Batman, Legion, Frank Miller coming on, um, Ronan. I mean, just amazing stuff. Then the stuff I loved, Alan Moore, Swamp Thing, Infinity Incorporated. You know, and, I, and I'm sitting here, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here remembering stuff now. I had stuff I was going to talk about before the video and stuff, but. Um, one book popped up in here. Um, where's it at here? Who's Who Number One came out in January of '85. Okay, and I brought up Crisis in here and stuff. But like some of the memories that it brought up was people I haven't thought about in so long. Uh, in 1985, there was a book in here, but um, I remember getting Crisis on Infinite Earth number four. Um, and what would happen was is that some of my friends, and I have not thought about them in, in years, uh, Mike, uh, Rodney, um, Tony, I think that was it. I think a guy named Chris might have been with us and stuff. But we had, uh, you know, walked out of the apartment complex and we took the little dirt road, went over a swinging bridge, came up behind a mall and walked about another two miles to the drugstore and everybody was doing their thing and I got across the living nurse and it was January. Or February and it was cold as hell and we decided to take a shortcut so we snuck across the road and they have an airport a little airport nothing major uh, in in Richlands and we decided to cut across this field that nobody was allowed to be on and stuff but we were like you know we're going to do it so we're going out in this field well we found out the damn field is a freaking swamp slash marsh and we're sinking in this freezing cold water up to our freaking knees and I'm dropping Avengers books with uh, the Fire Lord on the cover of it like in the 260s or something and the only book I ended up saving out of like about four or five I had because it was that rough was Crisis on Infinite Earths number four I mean I had finally got that book and I freaking needed it for my collection and stuff you know because you know you know Crisis was going on it was something else they were already moving on and stuff and oh my god you know got it off the spinner rack and stuff I started thinking about where are they at now. I know Mike lives in Florida with his second wife. Rodney got killed when he was about 20. His wife stabbed him when he was asleep, right in the heart. Uh, I saw Tony. He married a girl just as crazy as he is. He he is was, uh, and you know they deserved each other. You know that kind of deal. I mean he really met his match in the crazy department and stuff. And uh, and I just saw a video of the guy Chris man where like I don't you know we all age and we all get older but. It was just amazing because, like, the guy still skateboards, and he's about a year or two older than me. Uh, big gut, shaved head, beard, and he was doing a hula hoop on his girlfriend's porch. And he, was, and he still sounded like that little kid that got on her nerves, sitting there like, don't laugh at me, don't laugh at me. Like, he has not aged a bit. He is still back 30 years ago and stuff. I mean, it was just the synchronicity of all this coming together and thinking of all these people and then seeing them, you know, and stuff like that. And then I remembered, like, uh, you know, we get up to The Watchmen and stuff. And I read The Watchmen about a year or two after it came out, whenever that first graphic novel came out. I still have it. But when I got it, it looked shady as hell, man. There was, like, you know, we were, I was walking across Deskin's, Par Deskin's Parking Lot, which is a grocery store. And uh, it was twilight. The sun was going down and it had that weird effect, you know, with the sky between day and night. And uh, this guy was parked in his truck underneath a street lamp, and it looked like a bad black and white movie, man, because the cone was just perfect on his truck and stuff. And I walk up, and I'm like, you know, and it was like, pass him some comics. He passes me the Watchmen. We don't say too much, and I go on back to the house, and I read it. You know, it looked like a drug deal going down and stuff. Uh, so, yeah, so basically I've ended up walking through my life, you know. 
Um, so yeah, man, I started remembering things I have not remembered. That happens from time to time, man, but not so potent, not so real. I have literally walked through my life tonight, you know, and I, I can tell stories like that all night. But to pertain to comics and stuff, what it also triggered is that it kind of made me see that when it comes to comics, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And, uh, you know, somebody asked me, how do you know so much about comics or the way I talk and all this stuff? And, and the only answer I have is that, you know, I've just read this stuff. And when I say read, I, don't still, I just don't mean I read the stories. Um, I read editorials. I read freaking uh, the advertisements. I mean, to me, that Wallywood picture, I think it was Wallywood that did it, Joe Orlando. The Joe Orlando picture of the sea monkeys is just as much as of the mythology of the comics, just like Batman's origin, man. The the X-ray eyes, the little catalogs you used to be able to buy. Uh, you know, you'd order, the, you'd send like a buck in a stamped envelope to get a catalog of comics you could buy out of the store and you could get them in the freaking comics for like six and eight dollars a piece which was outrageous back then you know and stuff like that all that stuff i read everything and then uh read uh we had magazines like comic spectacular and if you found this stuff uh oh my god uh you know but i mean i read everything any article anything and absorbed it and went on with life i can also tell you the same thing about wrestling i can tell you about riding our bikes i can tell you about the camping and stuff and um one of the flashbacks I had just to, before I get off there, uh, the one the you know, but anyway, no, I'm not going to do another one. I've already skipped, we already skipped that part. But the things, but what made me, it, what got me is that it really made me remember this editorial I read, and I cannot believe I went right to it when I found it. Um, now, the first thing that I'm going to show you to get this idea of the more things change and more they stay the same in comics and stuff is that this is from 1975. I got this a month or two ago. And uh, I, I ended up getting the wrong book, but it was, it was a little bit about what happened in that book. This is the letters page, okay? This is the original internet message boards for all of us, 1975. This is a magazine that was published, I think, bi-monthly in the 70s. This is number seven before Harvey Com This is uh, before Harvey, Com Harvey got a hold of it and stuff, but they reprinted the spirit magazine, you know, the spirit stuff from the 40s and 50s. And in this particular issue, I think in issue number five, Ebony White came back. Uh, Ebony White was a sidekick, and he's drawn in a very negative, stereotypical way from the 40s and stuff by Will Eisner. And it's one of those things where I look at it like, this is where we were, and now let's look at how far we've come from this, you know, through uh, learning more and history, basically, and stuff. Okay, the way society has really changed a whole lot and stuff. And in the letters page, everybody's reacting to uh, a letter by two black gentlemen that were named Jim Brown and William Williams who had different opinions on Ebony White. And some of the stuff was as nasty as the stuff that you will see in, not in this particular, you know, their letters. One was very pro-Ebony White and one was very, how dare you stir up all that stuff and, you know, ignore how far we've come by printing Ebony White and stuff. Now, Ebony White is drawn in a very, you know, stereotypical way. His speech is very negatively stereotyped the way, you know, they, you know, they talk, they were expected to talk back then. Just go watch some old 30s and 40s movies, you know what I'm saying. But time has gone by, and what time has shown is when you go back and look at anything from history that negatively portrayed black men, Ebony White was actually treated with a lot of respect. He had a lot of guts. He had a lot of human feelings. And Will Eisner was a genius because he was just as equal as the spirit in this book. And this whole book is the Ebony White stories where he pretends he's a private eye and all this stuff, you know. And uh, very brave of them to do that in 1975, but it was the letters that were in there. I shy away from a lot of the internet now. I, if I get on a site, even on Facebook or anything like that, if I find my way there, I've, I've stopped reading comic books. It goes to the movies or anything like that. The internet is just too nasty. And, you know, I've got thick skin and stuff, but you got to watch what you put in your head because it's going to stay there. And I just don't need it. I also have gradually stopped watching uh, Green Arrow. Uh, I think I've watched maybe two or three episodes of The Flash. I quit Daredevil about four or five episodes in. I have DVD sets of Green Arrow over here that I've had since October. I haven't even opened. I'm just out of that stuff, and I don't know what's going on. Actually, I do know what's going on. Um, 
the stuff the reason I shy away from a lot of that stuff, uh, the negativity and thing like that, is that comic book fans have always been very hard to please because you're messing with, you know, the the continuity that they they like and they've learned and gotten used to in the comic books. You're messing around with characters and changing things for the big screen and they're really hard to make happy, you know, transferring anything to another place and any kind of changes and stuff that goes away from how they view a character. And we can be a nasty lot sometimes, you know. So that's what I'm saying with those letters in the, the in the, that, that I read in the spirit. It's kind of like, it's like that nowadays with the internet and all the negativity that people put in the comments and people lose their minds as soon as they see a trailer or a picture of a movie come out like people lost their damn minds about the Suicide Squad so they look like cosplay and stuff and they haven't even seen the movie and stuff and people are still like and I'm not saying that's right or wrong I'm just saying I think that's killed a lot of uh, the fun of it um, is if you get into reading the comment sections almost anything you can pick any article on uh, a Yahoo News uh, and I'm not saying they publish the you know greatest stuff ever, you know, but it's always this this nasty negative stuff that's out there, and that's what was like coming through with Ebony White in the letters pages and stuff. That's why I kind of said that you know some of that guy's letters that was very anti Ebony White. You know, I, I remember reading a few things there that was just as nasty as anything you can see on um, you know on the, on on you know the internet when fans come on there and stuff I'm also one of those people that uh, just just to let you have a just to be full honesty here and stuff uh, I said it before I'm one of those people that I do I do not like uh, uh, being referred to as a, a, a geek or a nerd because I enjoy this hobby this art form these stories and things like that uh, I come from that era where that was used to uh, emasculate you embarrass you uh, belittle you and you know, and if there's a generation out there uh, of new people coming into comics, you know, basically for the movies, video games are sucking, or you literally just you know discovered comics and stuff like that, and you're fine with that, you know, more more power to you, you know, um, you know, you're good for you, you know, you've uh, you've uh, overcome an obstacle that you didn't really have to overcome at all with uh, a lot of us guys that can still remember those days, and they weren't that long ago. But just to throw that out there, be prepared because once you start the journey of comics and stuff, you are going to get hit with people who look down on you if they find out you do like comics. You know, they're still out there. Okay. Um, you know, the movies are actually kind of not thrilling me more and more. You know, it's no big deal. It's this thing. And I think what it might have to do is where I have collected comics, this is the editorial, I can't remember. This is from 1986. If anybody wants to track it down, it's any com it should be in any comic, I don't know if they're direct market or not, of October 1986. So this came out um, August, end of summer. But this is the Legion of Superheroes, the Baxter series, number 27. Okay, And in here is an editorial that is a re that was a reaction to this miniseries that came out called DC Challenge. Uh, we're getting somewhere, don't worry. And this was 12 issue, a 12 issue miniseries that these writers had come up with for fun, where one creative team would write one chapter, have one plot going through it, and have some cliffhangers. The next writer would be brand new, and he would have to solve the cliffhanger, continue the plot, come up with a new plot or something, leave another cliffhanger, and then a new, another one would come on. They did this for 12 issues where they all kind of came together at the end and got it together with number 12. And apparently people went nuts, but people were still buying it. And that's what speaks the dollar, not the complaining, apparently, okay? But see if this doesn't sound familiar for today's market for you for you people, okay? Uh, now, the direct market that's coming up here, direct books from the 80s, was comic book shops were starting to pop up. They have not always been around. There was not always a whole bunch of them. I think they started popping up around the early 70s, probably in cities and stuff, and then they kind of gradually 
grew as we got into the 80s, just like the conventions and stuff. So DC, uh, and I think Marvel did too, they started doing things to complement and help the comic book shops do it by having a direct market. They would get books of higher quality that you can only get there, maybe some more adult books and stuff. That's the only place you could get them was at a comic book shop. Reprint series only at a comic book shop, and they kind of lost focus of what the intent was, okay? Uh, one of the promises of the direct only side of comics business was the variety we would be given. Since the early, since these early days when different titles like Cerebus, ElfQuest, and First Kingdom, they didn't really even have the term indie yet, okay, independent comics, were embraced by fans and shop owners alike, uh, we have watched the field expand and contract. As one of the big two, Marvel and DC, we have taken some bold steps with packages and materials. The fans seem to like that, and the owners have been able to keep their doors open month after month, so everyone thinks the business is doing okay. And it is. The problem is, however, is that the business should be doing better every day. Does that sound familiar? The question then becomes, what is wrong? Well, some of the answers are obvious. Higher prices. Too much product. Too many projects never arriving. Too many others never living up to the, living up to their potential. DC... 52, Marvel Now maybe, you know, uh, all the movies that are out and all the TV shows and all the things that should be getting people in more to buy these comics, rising prices, mainstream books cost more than indie books and if you collected comics any time in the last 30 years you should realize how crazy that is, okay. And there's more, at least to my mind. Fans have kept their business thriving by wandering into the local comic book shops every week and buying up the latest from the big two and whatever else attracts their fancy. Rather than encourage the expansion of the direct-only business by displaying an interest in the different types of genres possible, the fans, you the reader, uh, have latched on to the superheroes and little else. By latching on to these colorful characters, you have ignored the rich history of the comics field by ignoring crime comics. Western comics, science fiction comics, and even war comics. This is a complaint the professionals around the industry have aired for years without any satisfactory answer or explanation. In addition to wanting your superheroes and lots of them, the fans again, you the reader, have been looking for coherent universes. You seem to prefer to a you, you seem to prefer that to a random superhero in his own world. Now that's okay. Marvel and DC have both been benefiting for decades. But was it necessary to force the other publisher to jump on the bandwagon and have universes of their own? Doesn't it defeat the purpose of the independent market? And the independent is in quotation marks. Also, the fans seem to be interested in every superhero story published to fit into the universe. There have been resistance to doing super, uh, speculative stories. We definitely received resistance with DC Challenge. Nearly three years ago, a collection of our creators and friends gathered on a rooftop, brainstormed a comic for fun, a round robin that would lead us on a merry chase for the sheer fun and challenge of it. After a long birthing process, the series debuted and the mail began. How dare you publish a story involving the character that doesn't fit in continuity? That was a typical letter. What's the matter with having fun every once in a while? The creators had a good time and based on our sales, more than a few of you enjoyed the series because you came back month after month. We're in the business of providing entertaining stories, but no one obligated us to make sure everything fits in its place. This is the need to tell good stories or fun that disregards continuity because there are stories that should be told. Sure, continuity has its place. Heck, I edit who's who, and I'm working on history of DC Universe, but I also know when to sit back and just enjoy story. And so should all of you. Allow yourselves to suspend disbelief just a little bit more, as you, more than usual and relax. Laugh at the antics and the challenge and thrill to Frank Miller's masterful vision of Batman. In the end, all we ask is that you like what we do and that you do not pigeonhole every project to constricting tapestry. Now what I'm going to bring up, because I don't know when you're watching this video, but there's two things. They've just announced that Frank Miller is making Dark Knight 3 with another writer who's escaping my brain. It's probably Ed Brubaker or somebody. I can't think of who it is. And we're also getting told, enjoy, you know, Dark Knight Returns had just come out. Now we're doing the third one 30 years later. And they're telling everybody, just relax. And we're having Ed Brubaker come in so everybody doesn't lose their mind. And another thing is, is that he was talking about, you know, the shouldn't be wanting continuity and stuff. Well, after Convergence, they stated a couple months ago, DC Comics did, that not all their books are going to fit into a continuity. They're all going to be changing and everything like that. 30 years later. All right. So this is one of the few times if you made it to the end, you know, leave in the comments um, 
what you think of the editorials or anything like that. Have things changed or have they stayed the same or is it just different? You know, I, I see a pattern, you know, but that's in my head. You know, I just walked through my entire life tonight. 